Hi, I'm Ken Howard, and welcome to the Gay Therapy LA podcast. Today, I'd like to share with you what is daily mental health for gay men. So recently, on a Monday morning, I woke up ready to face the week and preparing to get my head in the game, doing my work as a gay men specialist, psychotherapist, and life, career, relationship coach. I had my usual morning routine, and a thought came to me about what is involved in adopting a good mindset for the week? What is daily mental health? I asked myself. And this differs for people in different circumstances, ages, geographic locations, privileges, challenges, and the balance of life-enhancing experiences versus life-detracting experiences, such as hardships or trauma. As I thought about what is daily mental health, especially for my client population of gay men, I came up with some various ideas to share with you. There are about seven of them, so let's go through one by one. So number one, each day we navigate interpersonal relationships that affect our mental health, whether it's enhancing it or detracting from it, whether that's with a partner or spouse, a roommate, a sibling, a parent, a boss, a co-worker, a neighbor, a friend, or a customer or a client. Each relationship means something different to us, probably in some kind of a mix of good things and bad that we associate with each of these people. We might have a co-worker whom we think is kind of an egomaniac, and we exercise caution about waiting to roll our eyes only when he can't see us do it. But then maybe he's hot, too, and it's a daily treat to see what Mr. GQ is going to wear today. Each personal interaction we face probably has an upside and a downside that makes us respond and react to that person internally and externally. Wouldn't it be nice if part of putting our head in the game to face each day were to be focused on the positive aspects of these interpersonal experiences. Can we forgive and try to overlook Mr. Braggart's latest bravado monologue and just focus on how fun it is to admire other things about him? And this is true for everyone. It's a lot less depressing each day if we deliberately focus on the positive traits of others. The gay icon, the singer Dolly Parton, even has a billboard out. Maybe it's for some organization just quoting her. I don't, I don't remember the purpose of the billboard. But it has a photo of Dolly with the quote, Find the good in everyone. It's old-time country wisdom for her, but it works for her, pretty obviously. She's very successful and, and so popular and adored. And we can adopt that kind of thing for ourselves. We don't want to take that to an extreme. We don't want to find the good in somebody who's hurting many people or something like that. But, you know, with all these, there's a certain amount of using common sense and reason. But her advice to find the good in everyone is a nice little mindset to adopt that kind of puts a boost to our day. So that's about the interpersonal relationships affecting mental health. Number two is, you know, I've discussed before about the importance to our mental health and quality of life each day about managing our resources of time, energy, and money. We all have those, maybe just in different proportions. We all get 24 hours in a day, and that's why time is considered the great equalizer. But we each have a different number of days allotted to us in this lifetime. Energy and money can vary greatly from person to person and also from era to era in our lifespan. What if we were to focus, again, that word we use to exercise our best approach to idealized and maximized mental health as we start each day on managing those resources of time, energy, and money in empowered and balanced and rewarding ways? Good time management is not only a mental health variable helping us to feel less stressed out and less of what author Louise Hay used to call being poor in time. You know, if we're always rushed, which is almost anonymous with, or synonymous rather, with being stressed, we declare internally 
that we are the owners and the keepers and the managers of how we allocate and distribute our time to tasks with ourselves alone and with others. When we are empowered in time, we feel like we are making the decisions of when to start something and when to stop it and how to do it during that duration. Are we balancing time between work and play? Are we balancing it among immediate, short-term, long-term, and very long-term goals? Are we spending time in ways that reward us? Even at work, you know, work is not play, so my, work might not be overall as rewarding or as fun as play, although for some of us it is. But maybe it's enjoyable because we feel productive. Or such, you know, when I do this, when I create content for my clients and followers, I enjoy the thought and the hope that spending time doing this might be helpful to someone. And that feels good, almost as much as something I might do personally or recreationally. It's kind of a different kind of rewarding way to spend time. Energy spent in empowered and balanced and rewarding ways is very similar because, again, we are reflecting on our values and making sometimes moment-to-moment -moment choices on what to spend energy on. Lots of self-help and advice resources repeat the caution that we are probably happier if we spend energy on things that are rewarding versus spending energy on more negative thoughts or feelings or experiences that bring us down, you know, such as ruminating on how someone has wronged us or perseverating on something we did wrong that we regret or rehashing something in the past that can't be changed anyway. Our energy is a finite, precious resource before we feel tired or spent or exhausted, and we have to rest up, either for a, take a break or a nap or a good night's sleep, until that energy is replenished, like when we plug in our smartphones to recharge. People are like that. You know, I, f I feel about 10% battery by the time I get ready for bed each night. Money is always, you know, the big one when we talk about spending it in empowered and balanced and rewarding ways in our daily tasks. It just costs money to live, you know, for things we have to pay for, like housing or electricity or insurances or transportation or food. And then there are the things that we have discretionary spending for, to a more or lesser degree. A good question to ask when we approach money is to think twice and test ourselves to make sure that we are spending our discretionary money, at least, in ways that speak to our values. Sometimes we are, and that's great, like sticking to a budget and feeling confident about that. Other times we realize that we are wasting money, you know, meaning spending a disproportionate amount of it on something that does not have a commensurate priority in our own value system. We're being ripped off by what we're paying for versus what we're getting. Spending too much on alcohol can be a common way that I hear gay men complain about money because our gay culture can be so focused around that with bars and clubs that are happy to take lots and lots of money from our community. Number three, another part of our mental health each day is to live with a self-awareness of what time it is, as I like to call it. It's probably dorky to spend too much time on this, you know, guilty as charged, but it can be interesting to think about where we are living in our time in history. I have another episode on that, and there's a blog article on that on GayTherapyLA.com about living in our time in history, if you want more detail on that. But it's basically an awareness about saying, what is the current atmosphere of our arts and culture? or our political landscape, or the current economics, or the climate, or the current state of our laws and customs. How might we be the same people, but living in a different era, like it was the 1920s? You know, for gay men, maybe our gay self-expression would be pretty darn validated, like if we lived in a relatively progressive time, like 1920s Weimar Republic in Berlin. But if we were living during the Red Scare, 1950s, the, the communist scare in America, gay men would be victims of a broad sense of threat 
about being found out as gay and socially and physically and politically and economically persecuted for it. We wouldn't be different people, but our time in history affects how we would have experienced our own mental health because of the effects the epoch has of our time on us. What about your phase of life? You know, is our mental health fine on this Monday morning we're talking about here, better or worse than it might have been 5, 10, 15, even 20 years ago, depending on how old we were then? Do we speculate about what our mental health might be like in those same 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years in the future? Would our mental health be affected by the traffic of our space car having to go from the Sea of Tranquility pod to our office in the Apennine Mountain region when we're all living on the moon. Those are actually places on the moon. You know, who knows? In 20 years, what we might be living with in terms of technology and the way people live then, it could be better because of technological advances and it could be worse by the effects of climate change. We can all feel the same throughout our lifespan, which is something that I've learned from older relatives. You know, here's a hint for you. Old people don't know that they're old. I mean, they do, but they, they tend to overall think like they did when they were young. That's why older people can feel a shock when they look in the mirror in the morning sometimes. My great aunt walking into the day room at her nursing home when she was having her 100th birthday party walked in and looked around and said, wow, where does a hundred years go? You know, because for her, it went by. She didn't think of herself as being that old, and yet she was, and many people don't make it as old as that. Our mental health can certainly be affected by the time of year. You know, for a sensitive to seasonal affective disorder, the, the lack of sunlight, depending on where we live on the globe, can unfortunately exacerbate depression. If it's our birthday, maybe there's a spring on our step from being in a celebration mood. Let's hope it's celebratory and not depressed. Maybe it's getting cool enough outside that we can finally wear our favorite fall jacket again. Maybe it's warm enough that we can skip the jacket or the hat and just head out for the day as is in the spring warmth. It can be orienting to our sense of self to consider these you know, the history, the phase of life, and the time of year that it is. Our mental health can even change in the course of the day. I often feel energized and creative at night when I do most of my writing, rather than first thing in the morning when just getting access to coffee takes an inordinate amount of real estate in my head. <laughs> the trick is to find something to enjoy about our current times, which can be challenging and our phase of life, which is unlike whatever comes before it or after it in the time of year. You don't really enjoy a pool party in February or try to build a snowman in July, again, depending on which hemisphere you live in. Our mental health is served best when we try our best to just enjoy where we are. Being in the moment and being very present, that's a, a component of good mental health that is actually shared by a lot of different authors and coaches and speakers. And I think it, you find it so commonly because it's so um, universally true. People get a lot of benefit of that. Number four, our daily mental health is also certainly affected by any kind of chronic psychiatric disorder or disability or condition, whatever you want to call it, that we live with. Good mental health on those kinds of days is adopting a mindset that helps us feel empowered to cope with our symptoms that we might not be entirely able to avoid. For most psychiatric disorders, it's usually about symptom management and adaptive coping strategies, more so than full symptom eradication or cure. You know, we wish it were that easy, but, but psychiatric disorders of all kinds tend to be more about management than they are about curing them, like an infection or a headache. So no matter what acronyms we're dealing with, you know, MDD, Major Depressive Disorder, or BPD, Borderline Personality Disorder, or Bipolar, personal, or bipolar Disorder, ADD, you know, Attention Deficit Disorder, OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, 
PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or others like general anxiety or dealing with the effects of substance recovery. We are reminding ourselves daily to either seek out new tools to cope with our symptoms, and that's where therapy comes in, hint, hint, or we are refocusing to practice the tools we've already learned and put them into practice anew each day. I'll sometimes work with clients on what happens between their sessions. You know, are we remembering and activating and using our cognitive tools that we learn in therapy? Can we reframe a negative thought that maybe pops into our head rather intrusively about ourselves or the world around us or our future? Aaron Beck, the, the father of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is one of my favorite techniques to use, among others, in my psychotherapy practice, said that the genesis, genesis of depression is those negative thoughts repeated almost relentlessly from one or more of those categories, negative thoughts about yourself, the world around you, or your future. But if we can stop and rethink and reframe that negative thought into something more neutral or even positive, we can lessen what's called its depressogenic effects. We can rewrite that automatic negative thought that pops into your head to lessen its effects. Like we're a copy editor of a, I used to say newspaper, nobody reads newspapers, but you know, be a copy editor who can rewrite a sentence to have a different meaning with the skills of the editor to say it in a different way, in a, in a more effective way. Can we identify a coping behavior to do when we have symptoms? You know, that's the other side of cognitive behavioral therapy is the behaviors. Do we need to activate progressive muscle relaxation? That's something I teach in sessions. Do we need to do a mental behavioral rehearsal to take the sting out of anticipating a stressful event like giving a speech at work. You know, my ex-boyfriend, who's still a very good friend, is a coach for that, by the way. You know, he is the business speaker, the underscore business underscore speaker, Bill McCrossan, on Instagram. And he's based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And that's the professional service that he provides. He helps speakers in, in business and maybe helps them to relax and, and be more effective. Do we need to ground ourselves by paying attention to our current surroundings if a traumatic thought is intrusive and distracting to us. Grounding techniques can help us to reorient uh, to the present when we might feel overwhelmed. Are we practicing what's called medication adherence and getting each of the daily doses of the medications that we've been prescribed by a psychiatrist so they can ultimately do their job? You know, not just a little bit when we're only getting partial benefit if we're not taking it consistently, but can we do medication adherence to the prescription regimen so that we get the full benefit in the bloodstream of the medication? Daily mental health means remembering and implementing the things that we're learning in therapy. And that's our homework. That's how you build on each session, one after the other, so that you're building and building and building your capacity to cope with whatever is going on with you. So that you get very close, if you can, to neutralizing the negative effects of the symptoms. In OCD, for example, you can learn to have what's called a subclinical OCD. It's not cured, but you cope with it so that it doesn't really have that much clinical negative impact anymore with treatment. Number five is, you know, good mental health can be about self-discipline. And this is a tough one, especially for people like me with ADD and distractibility that waste time. You know, time wasting and distractibility is not our friend. It doesn't help us reach the goals that we have for the day and Ultimately, you string together enough days and those are our lives. We have to remind ourselves with daily practice to conduct our lives according to our values, priorities, and goals of the day. We try to be ready to cope with intrusive distractions and events and little things that go wrong in the day that we didn't plan for. Those things throw us off track 
and our mental focus, our, our behavioral list of things to do, our to-do list, and even our mood. And when that happens, we need to remind ourselves, stop, pause, breathe, refocus, retake control, and recommit to what you were doing, what's important here. You know, gym workouts can be that way after we get done chatting with someone for a while. Okay, back, head in the games. What, what exercise were we doing? How many reps are we doing? What weight are we doing? You know, after we get distracted. We work toward our goals daily when we have goals for the immediate, like what are we doing this afternoon, the short term, like later this week or later this month, and the long term like the rest of this quarter or the rest of this year, and then the very long term, like finishing up our degree or a professional credential within a couple of years. Number six, another part of our mental health, similar to this about focus, is when we engage in the deliberate. I call it the deliberate work because there's a time for that, to get down to business, no distractions, and in deliberate play when it's not about earning a living or being productive or being ideal or even behaving ourselves. Gay icon Katherine Hepper in the great uh, golden age of Hollywood actress said, if you obey all the rules, you miss all the fun. <laughs> Don't you love that? People with OCD, also like me, have to remind themselves about this. And believe me, it takes work to remind yourself to play sometimes. Deliberate work and deliberate play is a big thing that separates us from being kids. It's a, a big part of this, you know, adulting word that you hear about these days, which means that you have to accept responsibility in order to get where you're going. I was raised by a very strict disciplinarian father, and I frankly don't recommend that, honestly, because it was not fun. But I do believe in a healthy, keyword healthy, self-discipline, because that yields rewards down the line. Slow and steady wins the race, which can be true in professional development, or building a business, or evolving a relationship, or managing your finances, or uh, improving your fitness, or building your physique. You know, acting with intention is another adage. Or living with determination is what we hear from a lot of people we admire who have achieved something that maybe we'd like to achieve something similar for ourselves, like writing a book or building our nest egg. Our last one, number seven, is mental health is about self-awareness of who we are in our past, our present, and our future. These things are most valuable if we focus on the best aspects of each, not the negative things about each. So from our past, we can't dwell on past traumas or the bad stuff, even though we do need to identify and acknowledge and validate and express our feelings. Again, therapy can help a lot with that. But we also want to focus positively on what we've learned through all of that. Can we make meaning of stuff that we've been through, even the bad stuff? Part of the last stages of healing from a trauma or traumatic experience is what we call making meaning of what that experience is. It's what my one of my business coaches, Casey Truffo in Orange County, California, calls the gift in dirty wrapping paper. Don't you love that? Sometimes a gift comes in dirty wrapping paper. You don't think it's a gift if you've been through some kind of a hardship, but imagine the gift if you learn something very, very meaningful for you that really has a poignancy in your life. What we have done or enjoyed in the past that maybe we can appreciate now about ourselves, maybe something we've always enjoyed, like a certain kind of music or a certain kind of movie, um, are there traditions around our family or around the holidays of the year that we like to repeat year after year from our past. And so maybe we can borrow some of the better things from our past and apply them to our present and our future. In our present, there would be plenty to be really bummed about if we based our mood on the latest CNN news update, you know, which is designed, we have to remember this, designed to provoke our negative emotions because those get our attention to sell their advertising, which is what their business is all about. 
It's that whole thing about rubbernecking on the on the highway when you see an accident. Ooh, what's that? Ooh, ooh. you know, uh, or watching a horror movie. You know, we like to be scared. We like to be stimulated. And news shows and advertisers know this. And unfortunately, they figured out negative feelings and negative images are more provocative and capture our attention more than positive ones do. So we have to remember when we're watching the news, we are being manipulated, even if they're seemingly telling just the facts. Some editor in video or in text is doing that in such a way that it captures our attention so that the advertisers get lots and lots of eyes and ears advertising their product. That's how they make their living. Everybody's got to make a living. So we can say in our present, what can we enjoy now, today? What's good about today? Is it a meal? You're having, you're having a good lunch with a friend? Is it spending time with someone we like? We're going to do some activity. We're going to go on a hike with our buddy, or we're going to take a walk in a park, or we're going to go shopping with our friend. Is it something that we can watch or be entertained by? Can we binge watch something on Netflix, which is a show that everybody seems to like these days? Can we be entertained by someone by going to a concert? Look at what Taylor Swift has done with her Eras Tour concert. Millions of people entertained by that, enthusiastically. Is it something we can read? Are we reading a book that we like? I usually have one of those. Is there something we can learn today that we didn't know even this time yesterday? So that's our present. And our future, you know, there's plenty to worry about. You know, anxiety is often the product of just saying, but what if, followed by some kind of fear scenario or negative circumstances? You know, in the classic film, gay icon film, The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy's leaving Glinda in Munchkinland. She's going off on the yellow brick road. And Dorothy has a line that says, but what happens if I... And Glinda stops her and says, just follow the yellow brick road. She doesn't answer the question. She's sending her off to her future down the Ellibic Road to find out for herself. And of course, we know what happened. She meets the friends and the scarecrow and the tin man and all that. But what Glinda says is, just follow the Ellibic Road. You don't even answer the what if. Because Dorothy's probably afraid, you know, what happens if I run into the witch? It's probably the wicked witch. It's probably what she's going to say. But just as, if, as we can say, what if followed by a negative prediction about our future... We can also say, what if about a positive scenario? You know, as long as we're in this business of speculating and trying to foretell the future, we can imagine a positive outcome just as easily as a negative one. You know, somebody said, look it up, I, I don't know who to attribute the quote to, I've been troubled in my life by the thought of many trials and tribulations, most of which never happened. I think it might have been Mark Twain. But you hear that? I've been troubled in my life by my many trials and tribulations, most of which never happened. That's a statement about this person's anxiety. You know, futures are tough things. You know, we may or may not have much of one. We can't predict that. We might live to be happy in, in old age, and for some of us, we won't. It doesn't work that way. Stuff happens. But whatever it is, we have to live with that anxiety that we just don't know. And that's okay. We don't know what's wrapped inside a gift, what's inside a wrapped gift. But, you know, we can learn to enjoy the anticipation of unwrapping it. Because regardless of what it is, the reveal is part of the fun. You know, like at your birthday or at the holidays when you get a gift and you unwrap it and say, Oh, what is this? What is the surprise? And even if it's not exactly what we wanted, maybe we can re-gift it or we can put it to some kind of good use. And if it is what we wanted, we get to celebrate and cherish and acknowledge it. Shirley MacLaine, the Hollywood actress, famously said, I deserve this, as she accepted her Academy Award. And that sounds a little more immodest than maybe I would choose to be, but you can hear the pride and the relief and the joy in that knowing that she probably tried the hardest she could working on that movie, bringing all of her acting skills to bear, all of her years of experience, 
all the early mornings and the long days on a movie set with the waiting and the makeup and the tedious this and that you know trying to get a hundred things to go just right and when it was time to celebrate getting her Academy Award well then it's time to celebrate yes it's true I worked hard and I deserve this so there are probably a hundred more tips and tricks and mindsets that we can put ourselves into to maximize our mental health at the start of each day but maybe these are just some ones that are right for you maybe some of them better than others it can make a difference about where we put our mindset at the beginning of each day which is why we do this work to work on ourselves to get better and better over time as we evolve and come into a better sense of ourselves because our day is worth it you know this life is worth it life is a gift to us from our universe but what we do with it is our gift back and we deserve this so to support the podcast if you would like if you're if it's not a hardship for you and you're so inclined uh, there's a new kind of mechanism for that um, and the, the URL is glow like the sun might glow G L O W dot F M Frank Mary uh, glow dot F M forward slash gay therapy L A with Ken Howard L C S W C S T I know that's long glow dot F M slash gay therapy L A with Ken Howard L C S W C S T if you would like to be a supporter of the show through your donations you don't have to but if you would like to if you're getting value and you would like to almost leave a tip that's fine um, your support helps to produce the show and to share it with guys around the world that it might be helping so please like and share and review the show so that other guys might benefit from learning about the show too if you're finding it helpful I sure hope you are and feel free to suggest topics for future episodes to me if you can think of something you'd love to see an episode devoted to and of course for help in your mental health each day or other kinds of well-being today or any day please consider having therapy or coaching with me therapy is for guys in california the state in the united states where i'm licensed to practice or you could have life, career, relationship, sex, coaching, and that can be from anywhere in the world if you're still awake in your time zone. <laughs> so you can visit the websites gaytherapyla.com or gaycoachingla.com for more details. You can call or text me at 310-339-5778. That's 310-339-5778 in the U.S. Or that's also my number on WhatsApp. Or you can email me, ken at gaytherapyla.com. I'd be happy to help. So thanks, and I'll see you next time.